Gotta play some ribbon. <sighs> right. Thank God you've returned. I need your help. There's a great deal of history that you should know. I read the books. Come on, come on, come on. Want the roller coaster. All right. Roller coaster time. Let's go. Big clunk. I love this ride. That's, that's the good part. I always remember that being longer. All right, time for some ribbon. Oh, right. Did I remember to open the steam valve? I'll go back. At least I get to ride the roller coaster again. I do love this ride. Ugh. Can't I just put all the discs in at once? Huh. Suppose I could with one of these. This weird little drive does make that possible. Let's go look at how. It's the Nakamichi MJ-5.16, a pretty unwieldy model number, and it looks just like any ordinary PC CD-ROM, but as the bezel suggests, it's actually a tiny five disc changer. You can put five data CDs in here, not just audio CDs like most disc changers, and switch between them on the fly from inside your computer. And it's hard to believe that works, but it's actually not that impressive once you see how it's done. It just leverages some unintuitive qualities of CD-ROMs. The really remarkable thing about it is just how unremarkable it actually is. And the drive wasn't terribly expensive or terribly hard to get. And in fact, I'd say really the strangest thing about it is probably that it wasn't more popular because things were pretty rough when it came to CD-ROMs in the 90s and 2000s. <laughs> It might sound odd to say it this way, but Compact Disc was probably the longest running physical medium for software delivery. It was in use at least as early as 1986, and while it took a few years to really catch on for consumer machines as anything other than a novelty, it eventually became the lowest common denominator. Nowadays, of course, CD-ROMs aren't very impressive. 650 megabytes is nothing. I remember being unimpressed by CD-ROM storage density even when I was young, but I had missed the heyday of the format by just a couple years. When it was introduced, CD-ROM was a game changer. Consider that in 1992, a typical consumer hard drive ranged from probably 40 to 220 megabytes. That's what was in all the magazines at the time. There may have been larger ones, but that seems to have been the typical range. If you were at the low end of that range, a single CD offered more than an order of magnitude more storage than your PC had built in. And even at the high end of the range, it was still over three times the capacity of the largest typical consumer hard drive. And that should put in perspective just how impressive CD-ROM was even years after it hit the scene. Imagine when it was brand new. Of course, hard drives did get much bigger in the 90s, and CPUs got faster, and memory got cheaper, and still, most software never came close to filling up even a single CD-ROM. I haven't checked, but... This thing here, whatever it is, is probably only 10, 15, maybe 40 megabytes. Games, on the other hand, had always been hungry for additional resources. And since 90s PCs could finally display high resolution, high speed images, developers started making much bigger games that used tons of images, 3D textures, and full motion video clips. By the middle of the decade, some games had blown past 650 megs and some even past the gigabyte mark. 
But CD-ROM, the lowest common denominator, it had to stay the same because all the drives were standardized. It couldn't be expanded to keep up with that growth. So it started out at about 650 megs. It never grew much beyond 700. So larger titles had to be spread across multiple CDs. And this was inconvenient in a few ways. At first, it just meant that you couldn't install a game in its entirety. Uh, 90s first-person adventure games in particular, like Myst, Journeyman Project, Gabriel Knight, or the many games that cloned those, like this one here from a few years later, used tons of images, video clips, and sound files. That's pretty much the entire game. It's just playing back images and video clips and sound files. And those were huge. Uh, they were so much bigger than any hard drive on the market that installing them to your computer was just out of the question. Instead, uh, games would install a little stub executable on your PC that would then load all the game data from CD on the fly. Now, getting Myst to run from a CD was legendarily difficult in 1993. There's a whole documentary on YouTube about it. It's pretty fascinating. But this was the only option at the time. Because of its sheer size, there was just no other way to go. And adventure games continued to lead the market in terms of volume for years, since they mostly consist of static scenes and the gameplay contains very little in the way of Twitch action, they don't need to run from a hard drive or load a lot of data into memory at once in order to play at full speed. They could afford to load on the fly from a relatively slow CD-ROM drive. And since CDs are interchangeable, developers realized that they could expand their titles pretty much as far as they wanted by just providing more discs. So while those early adventure games like Myst used up a whole CD, a remarkable amount of storage for the time, when their sequels came out, like Riven or Buried in Time, a few years later, they had all grown to much larger sizes. For instance, Gabriel Knight 2, The Beast Within, came out in 1995, and this box contains six discs. I can't show them all to you because the box will fall apart, but there you go, disc six, do the math. This game is 3,900 megs, or almost four gigabytes, at a time when most people's PCs didn't even store an gigabyte. So this game from 1995 could almost fill a DVD, and DVD would come out a year or two later, so things were keeping up with the growth of data, right? Well, while it could have relieved this situation almost as quickly as it began, PC DVD-ROM drives didn't become commonplace, let alone ubiquitous, until the mid to late 2000s. So it took a few years for DVD software to show up, and even once it did, publishers continued releasing CD-ROM versions of even major games well into the decade. So probably just about anyone who was gaming in the 2000s had at least one multi-CD title. At first, like with adventure games, that just meant you had to swap discs at some point while playing the game. And that was usually smoothed over pretty well. Anybody who played the PlayStation Final Fantasies, for instance, remembers that swaps occurred at comfortable chapter breaks. PC games were usually like that too, although some, like Riven, seem to really enjoy being buzzkills. When hard drives hit multi-gigabyte sizes, it started making more sense and becoming more necessary to install games in their entirety. Even Half-Life 2 could be had on CD when it was originally released. And that certainly couldn't run from CD, so you had to copy the whole thing to your PC to play it. And if you didn't have a huge hard drive, when you wanted to switch to another game, you might end up having to delete Half-Life 2 and install the other game and then go back to Half-Life 2 four or five discs at a time whenever you wanted to change games. I certainly did have to do that. That was a pretty minor irritation though. The bigger problem is that a lot of games began to require the CD in the drive at all times for no good reason, except that anti-piracy efforts had reached a fever pitch and virtually every major title used the CD as a form of copy protection. Some games in the 90s did this, they checked for certain files to prove you had the CD, but in the 2000s, software vendors adopted products like Securom that used weird tricks to prove that a real CD was in your drive, and those couldn't be easily bypassed without a crack. It has long been an article of faith that copy protection, DRM, harms consumers more than pirates, and this was certainly true in my experience. Throughout the 2000s, I just played whatever I wanted, however I got it. I loaded ISOs with a CD emulator, I used cracks to eliminate discs entirely, it didn't slow me down for even a second. Meanwhile, everyone who wanted to play a legitimately purchased copy of The Sims 2 had to have the disc in the drive at all times, even if they'd installed the entire game. Your little brother has it locked in his room and he's at school? Too bad. Even though he's not playing it, you sure aren't either. Not without a disc that the game does not need to load any actual data from. 
It was actually not unheard of to image CDs you actually owned and load them with a disc emulator or even just crack a legitimately purchased title just because of this kind of irritation. I certainly did both, and even though I haven't pirated anything in probably 15 years, there are still some modern games that really make me want to go back to that. Also, during editing, I decided to look into how unpleasant Half-Life 2 actually was on CD, and it turns out it was outright broken. Valve shipped it with an installer bug that would cause it to crash if you didn't install Counter-Strike Source, but it wouldn't actually do that until you made it to the fourth disc during the install. Uh, and of course, you'd have to swap through all four discs again and again as you tried to figure out if you were the reason it was crashing. Even worse, it would then refuse to decrypt the game files unless it could phone home to Valve and verify that you actually owned it, which is why it is apparently now impossible to play the original game even if you own the discs it shipped on without using basically a crack. So if you were wondering what it would look like to mix the hell world of modern DRM with the hell world of game shipping on 20 year old media formats, now you know. Anyway, we now return to Sewing with Nancy. So dealing with CDs sucked, but imagine this. What if you had enough drives to just leave all the discs in at all times? You don't have to swap discs between games or within a multi-disc game if you just have every disc in all the time. And of course, that's a completely absurd, totally ridiculous solution. Nobody would do it. It's, it's just completely petty. Just put the dang disc in the drive, come on. But if you wanted to, it's not as impractical as it sounds. If we imagine we're in the early 2000s, of course there were CD burners and DVD drives and whatnot, but a really basic CD-ROM could be had for as little as 10 bucks if you knew the right places to shop. This, this isn't one of those, this is a full DVD burner. I couldn't bring myself to buy a plain old CD-ROM. If you wanted, say, five plain CD-ROMs, that wasn't a lot of money, and it was a good match. Um, Riven, for instance, came on five discs, which I've lost three times over. I own three legitimate copies of this game and I don't know where I put any of them. So I definitely own Riven, a lot of Riven. So five drives would probably be about the max that you would typically need for this sort of weird shenanigan. Now each drive would of course take up a chunk of space in your PC. You can imagine it would be about mm, this much, which is a lot, but five bay cases weren't hard to get at the time or even terribly expensive, even if they're pretty rare nowadays. Now, connectivity would have been a bigger snag. Uh, SATA only hit the scene in 2003 or so, and while well, some motherboards had it, it was usually just a couple ports, which you'd usually want to use for your hard drives. Uh, same problem with USB. Uh, external drives were relatively expensive, and you probably didn't have enough free ports on your motherboard. So you were looking at adding hardware to make either of those possible. Now, you could just use plain old IDE. Uh, you usually had a pair of onboard IDE ports that could each run two drives, total of four, and then you could plug one more CD-ROM into your spare SATA port if you had one. You'd spend a little bit more, but you could do it. You could make this work. Or you could also not do any of that, not buy a huge tower case, not buy five CD-ROMs, not buy extra cards, and not fill your PC up with cables, and instead just buy the Nakamichi MJ 5.16 and put five discs in one bay. See. That's a nice compact unit, and it's really easy to use. There's no special software, there's no configuration. In Windows, this shows up as five separate drives with their own drive letters, and sure enough, there's Riven, discs one, two, three, four, and five, which I legitimately own three times over. I just don't know where any of my 15 Riven discs are right now. Of course, this is too good to be true. You know there's no way that this contains five entire CD-ROM mechanisms, and you're right, it doesn't. I can't read all of these disks at once. When I click on disk one, for instance, it does load right up. There's my files, just like any other CD-ROM. But when I click on disk two, this happens. All those noises are the changer part of the mini changer. See, I haven't actually sent disk swaps to the Shadow Realm like I said. I'm just letting the drive do them for me. These drive letters are virtual representations of the disks inside the Nakamichi. When I select one, the drive tells Windows to wait, and then it pulls the disk from an internal magazine and puts it in the actual reader. Now, if you ever had a multi-disc home stereo CD player, you might be wondering how this miracle is possible because those things were often bigger than an entire AV receiver. 
This is smaller than a Blu-ray player. Where could it possibly have room for all this stuff? Well, let's take a look. Fortunately, this thing is really easy to open up and the mechanism is pretty simple, so it's not hard to see how it functions. Just a couple screws and the top comes right off, right off, comes, it comes <clears throat> right off. You can see exactly what's going on. This plastic rack is the magazine. It has five slots that hold discs, and in the center is a single tall spindle for all of them. Both the magazine and the spindle can move up and down. And you can't see it, but there's a carriage motor in here with rubber rollers that can move discs in and out of the drive, just like any normal slot loading CD-ROM. When I press the button for disc one, the magazine moves all the way down, then I put in the disc, and you can see it go partway in and stop. Notice it doesn't slide all the way to the spindle in the back because that's not actually where the action happens. Instead, it's landed on a second spindle hidden under this plate. I tried to take it off, but it's, it's all coupled into the gear train there. So it's hard to see what's going on, but from this angle, you can tell that there's a completely ordinary CD-ROM mechanism in there. It's got a spindle, it's got a laser assembly, the works, and the disc actually lives here when it's in use. This magazine is just for storage, as the name suggests. So the actual CD-ROM operates up here, but then when I want to put in another disc, I press the disc two button. The magazine spindle then retracts and the drive pushes disc one back into the magazine, sliding it into the first slot, then moves to the second position. And I can now put in my second disc. Now, up until this point, you might've been wondering how it's possible for the changer and the reader to both fit into this chassis because the drive is shorter than the diameter of two discs. And sure enough, they can't. So how does it have room for both storage and playback? Well, you can see now that it's actually really simple. Disc two slides into the reader and it spins up and it's just overlapping with disc one. That's the answer. The drive doesn't have enough room. It has to intersect the two mechanisms to make it all fit. And that's fine because the drive knows exactly where the discs are because it knows where they aren't. When it pulls a disc from the magazine, the spacing left between the slots provides just enough room for everything to overlap without anything running into anything else. And while it seems weird to read a CD that's partially obscured, that's how they work anyway. The read head only needs to have access to the full width of the disc in any one location. Since that's up near the front, not back there where the overlap happens, everything just works. So rather than being miraculous, I think you'll agree, this is actually very pedestrian. They didn't really invent any brilliant technology here. I mean, very few of us could have built one of these, but it's not hard to see how easy it was for Nakamichi. This is, in fact, as far as I know anyway, just the mechanism out of one of Nakamichi's consumer audio disc changers, the sort you could get in your car if you had a BMW or a Mercedes or just spent a lot on an aftermarket sound system, or if you had a home stereo system with a CD changer. Because, yeah, if your parents had one of those huge turntables with a disc that moves around, I think those were the cheap trash option because you could get much smaller units, not only from Nakamichi, but from Pioneer as well. The technology was positively ancient by the late 90s, and while it wasn't cheap as free or anything, it certainly wasn't exotic. And that's why, in 1998, these drives could be had for only $149. Of course, this specific drive probably didn't cost that much. It probably cost a little bit more, closer to about $240. But it was probably also not really in the running for the average PC owner anyway, because it's a little special. See, I bet some of you were surprised when it showed up as five drives in Windows, because that would usually be impossible, even with some electronic trickery. And I said that there weren't any special drivers or anything, so that shouldn't work. The standard interface for storage devices in the consumer market in the 90s was IDE, also known as ATA, an ancient, crusty standard that used these 40-pin ribbon cables and supported two unique devices on one cable, no more. You could make a drive, conceivably, that pretended to be two drives, but not five, not without very unique drivers if it was even possible at all, which I don't think it was. But this drive is not IDE. It uses a SCSI interface, which changes a lot of the math here. SCSI is actually a pretty old technology. I don't remember when it came out. I didn't check. I'll, I'll put some sort of bug up here about that. But it was the go-to throughout the mid to late 80s at least, and well into the 90s, uh, for connecting high-performance devices. So high-speed hard drives, tape drives, non-standard CD-ROMs, and a lot of other stuff, like uh, flatbed scanners, for instance. We got IDE on consumer PCs, mostly because it was cheap. SCSI was more expensive, but it, in a lot of ways, was much better. Other than being faster and more flexible, it also supported up to 
eight physical devices on a single cable. But even further, it supported LUNs, logical unit numbers, which were a way for a single physical device to represent itself as multiple logical devices. In other words, the five drives in one drive trick is actually fully natively supported by SCSI. Like I said, it's a lot better than IDE. It is a little more tedious to set up though. You may remember how big and unpleasant IDE connectors were with their 40 pin connectors and huge ribbon cables. SCSI is even worse. Instead of 40, they use 50. The cables are bulky is one way to put it. And they can't do the cable select trick that IDE had. So you have to manually assign a physical ID number to each device on a cable so that they don't talk over each other. And much like an IDE hard drive, you do this with jumpers but more of them. The jumpers on an IDE drive just had two possible values, primary or secondary. And no, I'm not using the problematic and objectively wrong terminology of the era. The two drives on IDE chain were perfect equals, so we never needed to invoke imagery of some of the worst imperialist crimes in history to describe them. That shit was completely uncalled for in addition to being outright incorrect. Don't even think about commenting on it. I'll ban you. At any rate, IDE drives only had two options, but this drive has eight. So you have to enter the drive ID on a set of three jumpers. That's three bits for zero, one, two, oh, three, four, five, six, and seven, total of eight values. Fortunately, you don't need to memorize binary because the little digits here tell you what the position values are. So you just add them up to get the number you want. For seven, you would pick uh, four, two, and one, or for three, you would pick two and one. That's how binary works. But once that part's done, you just plug it in and the LUNs will be automatically discovered. You can see here my Adaptech SCSI card shows five distinct drives on startup. That's why Windows can just access them all individually with no special drivers, because they all show up to the OS as distinct SCSI CD-ROMs. And that's it. It's simple. It's very clever. And I don't know why it wasn't more popular. This could be the solution to my Riven problem, right? But you know, I don't just want to solve the Riven problem. I want to stop swapping disks forever. And if SCSI can do multiple drives on one cable, and this drive does five disks, why not another drive? That would be 10 disks. All right here, and my fingertips, or even more. Three drives, 15 disks, four, five drives, can you get a six bay tower? Is five the limit? Is five all we can do? It can't be. You know, you know IDE. IDE is a garbage standard. You know how long the cables in IDE go? 18 inches. That's nothing. Now SCSI, SCSI is a standard for real professionals. Those cables can go 20 feet. We don't need the drives to be in the computer. We can have as many as we want. We can have all the disks at once.
Z? What the hell comes after Z? Yeah, um, that looked cool, but you can't quite go that hard. You can get close though. You've already been acquainted, but this here is the MDI SCSI Express, which is pretty much just what it looks like. It's a PC case with no PC in it. It's got an AT or ATX power supply. I think AT, I didn't check. And then it has SCSI interfaces. These are SCSI connectors. Actually, that's only a half truth. SCSI used many connectors over the years that it was in use. Uh, in fact, I think there might still be a SCSI variant around today. And they ranged from very, very large, like we have here, to surprisingly tiny. This is actually not as small as they go. But the signal format largely stayed the same. So if you want to do anything with SCSI, you got to have all these adapters around. And you have to have terminators around if you're using multiple devices. This has to go on the end of the SCSI chain to prevent signal reflection. Inside this case, we have seven, actually eight, drive bays. Although it's interesting, I don't exactly know how you would ever get eight drives at once because the actual SCSI controller in the computer you connect this to has one of the IDs on the chain. It's always gonna be ID seven or zero. So I don't know why you would make an eight bay case. Maybe there's something missing, I don't know. But you can see that we've got just ordinary AT power supply cables in here and then this absolutely ridiculous, gigantic cable with 50 wires. These were not a whole lot of fun to work with, let me tell you. The jumpers weren't fun either. I had to set all the jumpers on all these drives and I got them wrong twice. I had to pull them out and put them all back in. But I got it all working and it's really doing what Nintendo don't. Firing this machine up is truly cacophonous. That was every single one of these drives racking its magazine and loading up a disc. It is, <laughs> it is so much fun. So after these are ready, we plug them into a PC, we boot up the machine, and then when the SCSI card searches for drives, it finds the entire inventory. 35 unique devices, that's a lie, because the bottom two drives turned out to be malfunctioning, so I had to disconnect them. So there's 25 devices, which is no less impressive, really, given that most people never see more than four. So then we finish booting up into Windows, we open Explorer, and there they all are. All the disks, except only, sort of. We can see a floppy drive, a hard drive, an IDE CD-ROM that I left in the machine, and then tons and tons of these virtual drives. You'll notice they all have names next to them. This is a clever feature. They could have just left them all blank because you don't really know what's in them until you load one into the drive, right? But that would be awful. You'd have to spend like three minutes every time you were looking for a disc, loading one after another to find out which disc is in which slot. They solved that problem here by caching the information. When you put in a disc, the drive or Windows, I'm not sure which, reads it and caches the label so you can see which one is which before you pick one. Then of course, when you do select it and actually open the drive, it just quietly switches from one disk to another with just a couple seconds delay. It's all pretty slick, honestly, except that not all the drives are here. Even without the full 35 disk complement, we aren't even at the 25 that are connected. There's only 22 Nakamichi drives represented here in Explorer. And that's because Windows will not and cannot assign more than 25 drive letters. I'm gonna say right now that if you comment smugly about how macOS or Linux don't have this limitation or say anything at all about it, I will ban you from my channel because, buddy, I know, I probably know more than you do about it because I read the old new thing and I'm certain you don't. I did in fact set this up on one of my Macs and sure enough, it indexed all 25 disks, no problem. And in fact, the friend who sent me a couple of these drives included a video clip showing that on their system with a fully populated tower, it not only indexed the disk labels, but the icons as well, giving a completely transparent experience even for the high expectations of the platform. So this is purely a Windows limitation, and it's one of the silliest problems and one that Microsoft has been refusing to fix for decades. It was absurd for it to still be around in XP, but honestly, it didn't even make sense in Windows 95. Even then, Microsoft had implemented a complete virtual abstract file system with really clever backwards compatibility. They did not need to keep up the DOS disk management charade then, and we definitely don't need it now. 
It's one of the most embarrassing things about Windows, which is otherwise remarkably well designed in ways I won't debate. You can go read about them. Windows is an amazing achievement for the most part, and the most frustrating thing about it is just that what it gets right stands in such stark contrast to what it gets very wrong. To wit, Windows NT does have support for this many disks. It always did since the first release. It just doesn't have support for them in the root file system. If I open up Windows Disk Management and then scroll down, we'll see the first few drives and then some more and then some more and then sure enough, the last few of them without letters assigned. They show up here, Windows can see them. And if we had the full complement, the whole 35, we could see those all as well. So it really sucks that you can't assign drive letters that'll actually show up in my computer to these devices, but you can still access them. The easiest way to do that is to mount the disks as virtual directories inside an NTFS volume. In other words, much the same thing you do on Linux. Here, I've created directories for drives 23, 24, and 25, and I can go into disk management, select them, and mount them to those folders. Now I can go in and open them, and there's the contents of those disks. So the support is there, but honestly, it's not really a complete solution. The assumptions that software, especially games, made about CD-ROMs ranged from very flexible to draconian. At one end of the spectrum were programs that did it right. Riven, for instance, which I do own legitimately, depended on a CD to run, but it didn't need to be in a specific drive or anything. The CD wasn't used as DRM, and the game was made by Mac users, who were probably used to the Mac's ability to identify volumes by name, not physical drive. So even on Windows, when the game looks for a CD, it just checks all available drives, finds the disk, and that works like a charm. Here's what it looks like when everything goes to plan. As you're playing Riven, you can wander around on the first disc for quite a ways. The first disc swap happens at the end of this badass maglev roller coaster ride. Play this game if you haven't. It has aged wonderfully. As soon as you reach the end, it asks you to put in disc three, and then you have to fumble around and find disc three and put it in. It's, it's a real bummer. It breaks the immersion right after one of the coolest moments in the early game. But now let's do that again after loading all five discs of Riven, which I legitimately own, into one of the Nakamichis. Now, when I reach the end of the ride, it stops reading disc three. We see the light stop blinking, and then we see it load disc one, and that light starts blinking. It just takes a couple seconds, and we can just keep going. It's exactly what I always wanted. When I first saw this work here in my lab, I literally shouted. I shouted, I was like, yes! And then I just got back in the maglev, wrote it back, and when it got to the other end, it loaded up disc two, and it just worked, and I shouted again. I was like, yes! It was exactly as exciting as it would have been when I was 10 or 12 years old, and it basically validates this whole concept. It was awesome, and it was also the best outcome. Everything kind of goes downhill from there, at least a little bit. Heavy Gear 2, for instance, is a game which installs 450 megabytes of files to your hard drive, but still refuses to let you play the single player campaign without the disk in. We can assume this is DRM. It will scan all available drives in the system for the disk, but it does it in a heavy handed way that actually attempts to open each drive and read the contents. So I've seen this hang for 10 minutes and then pop up 20, please insert a disk in drive X messages. So that's not a seamless experience. And of course, neither this nor Riven nor a lot of other games would likely work with an NTFS folder mount. They're only going to scan drives with letters for the game data, so you'd never be able to run them with a disk in any of the last drives down here. Of course, if you're only running a four drive setup, that problem would never come up. Another arguably minor potential problem were games that asked you to type in the path to the CD-ROM when you swapped disks. This was better than nothing because you weren't limited to a single drive and you could probably even use an NTFS mount, but you had to remember which letter was which disk and that's almost as bad as just doing the swap. I can't find any examples of this now, but I know I saw a few of these back in the day. Even single disc games might require you to always have the disc in the drive they were first installed from, which is just, just rude. There were games that used an any file to point to the CD-ROM, and those could be configured to point at different drives, but that doesn't help with multi-disc games either, since you can't change the config file on the fly. And I don't know if these would have looked like normal CD-ROMs to games that were looking for CD-ROM specific features. I would guess a lot of games were probably pretty picky about things like Redbook Audio or, God forbid, DRM. I feel like these would probably confuse Securom pretty bad, although I didn't have a chance to test. But really, 
All these caveats are guesses about potential issues that I haven't seen. When I wrote this script, I assumed there would be a lot of problems, but then I tested a few games and it all worked really smoothly. It seems like you actually could have done this in 1998 if you had as much money as you lacked patience. So congratulations to me, I guess. I thought I was making clickbait, but I actually played myself. This thing kicks ass. If you could have afforded it back then, you absolutely should have built one. Five stars. And of course, we know almost nobody would have actually had the money in space and media library and desire for this to make sense. It's a pipe dream. Some stunt you might have heard of on a forum or seen in a magazine, you would have drooled over it, but you never really would have tried to assemble this. I'm not surprised that I never saw one of these in someone's ancient nerd cave photos, but what I still can't figure out is why the individual drives weren't more popular. It really seems like not that many people bought these, but they should have been everywhere. Even if some software might not have played nice with these, there was definitely still some cool stuff you could have done. For instance, these will play music. There's analog outputs front and back like any other CD-ROM. Presumably you could do digital audio as well, although I never had much luck with that for some reason. Audio CDs were still super popular in the late 90s, so you could treat one of these like a five disc audio CD changer that you can control entirely from software, and that was still pretty cool in 1998. You could also just have access to more data discs at one time. Back in those days, there was still a lot of stuff coming on CD that we would now grab off the internet. Uh, stock photos, stock sounds, stock music, for instance, uh, programming references, that sort of thing. You can have a whole bunch of discs like that in your PC 24-7, so you don't have to scrounge up a disc and scratch up a disc just to put it in and see if maybe it has the one little WAV file you're looking for. Discs get treated a lot better, I would think, being shuffled around by these than shuffled around by hand. And not to harp, but most single disc games and most other non-game software probably worked just fine. So there were definitely use cases here with one drive or with multiple, and there's just no substitute if you want nearly instant access to five or more CDs at once. I certainly would have murdered for one of these at the time, and I'm sure a lot of other people would as well. So why have I never heard of them before? I don't know. Looking through back issues of computer magazines, there's almost no mention of these things. Popular Science in April 1996 spent half a page on PC disk changers as a general topic. Uh, they even mentioned the Nakamichi alongside several other models. There were other companies throwing their hats in the ring. Um, Pioneer, JVC, I think Kodak were all doing this. All the same, this isn't a huge amount of coverage. Um, although we can see that even in 1996, the Nakamichi models of that time were only $279, which was not that unreasonable for an enthusiast PC component. PC Magazine had a decent comparison article in January 1997 as well, probably the best coverage I found on any of these. And it again mentioned several different models. But that's about all the actual coverage I could find, just these couple articles, uh, and then up through 1998, the Nakamichis and some other models showed up in the catalog pages at the back of several magazine issues, and then it all just evaporated. Going off of what Google Books and Internet Archive have scanned, uh, these drives seem to have vanished from print publications before the year 2000. Your mileage may have varied if you were there. Maybe this was a big deal, maybe people loved them. It was very normal to see these in whatever circles you ran in at the time. But I feel pretty safe, at least, saying these didn't blow up the market. And I don't really get it. These were cool. I mean, they weren't the quickest drives on the market, uh, but they weren't too bad, honestly. They're all 16 speed, and there were 32 speed drives at the time, but for anybody who wasn't that much of a speed demon, these were perfectly acceptable. It's not like they were 2X. The SCSI interface also seems like a possible turnoff. Um, I don't think that that many consumers had SCSI in the 90s. This is out of my wheelhouse, but that's the impression I get, that you probably didn't even consider getting a SCSI drive unless you were doing something high performance or commercial. But either way, it's irrelevant because there was an IDE version of this drive, but I can only find evidence of it in the back of magazines in the catalog section. It looks like it cost even less than this one, and it would have worked in any PC, we can assume that. From the limited info I can find sort of scattered around, it does sound like it didn't do the five drive trick, but that actually would have been better. 
From what I've gleaned, the IDE version presented itself as a single drive instead of multiple. And then when you changed disks, it would just swap the disk in that one drive. You had a special program for doing it, or you could just press the buttons on the front. And that would be more compatible. That would work with more software. Honestly, that should work with, with pretty much everything. There's no trickery going on at all, no weird delays. Any program should see that as the same action as you taking the disk out and putting another one in because that's pretty much what it's doing. It's just doing it for you instead of you doing it by hand. I don't have one of those to test with, unfortunately. I couldn't find any for sale, so I can't prove this. It's all based on a support thread from 2003 on the Gen 2 forums, but it seems plausible. I don't know how else they would have done it, and it would make an outrageous multi-drive setup far more practical. In 2004, having four or five disk IDE changers hooked up would give you access to 20 disks, but they would only show up as four ordinary CD-ROMs and would behave a lot more normally and it wouldn't have run into Windows stupid drive limitations. So really, I wish I had one of those to test with, but I don't. So unfortunately, that's about all I have to say about this. For now, at least, because this isn't all I have to show you. It's just all I have to show you this week. There's actually a ton of backstory that I haven't covered on why towers like this were sold. They were not actually meant for gamers and why a wacky seven drive setup like this was actually very practical if you were in a totally different demographic. But it's really a different story entirely, so I'm gonna cover it in another video a little bit later. I hope you enjoyed this video, though. If you did, please subscribe to my channel so I know you're into this sort of thing, and remember to turn on notifications if you wanna find out when I upload new stuff. But if you really enjoyed it, consider supporting me on Patreon, like these people are doing here. Buying ancient hardware on eBay and hoping it works is a nice way to throw money down the drain if you have too much. Shipping heavy steel boxes around costs a bundle, and I'm lucky that only two of these drives were dead. My studio is full of plenty of other things I took a risk on that didn't work out even this well, and I'm out a bunch of money on them, so I'm glad that didn't happen here. But I couldn't even afford to try obtaining these things without the support of all my patrons. I'm so grateful to all of them for keeping me going. Thank you so much. And to everyone else, thanks for watching.